Crystal, I want to start with you, and I appreciate you joining. Uh, you had a very impactful post on your social media channels, Twitter and Instagram, about how black athletes are viewed and used the word athletic. Can you explain that to our viewers? Yeah, I mean, uh, these two gentlemen on the, uh, on the interview right now can back, back me up, but I guess you know, the term pace and power has been around for so long. And this is actually kind of one of the first times I've been hearing about it. But, you know, the post that I made was kind of referencing the whole pace and power uh, argument. And basically, I was just stating how I feel like I am portrayed in the soccer world. Uh, I think I get a lot of recognition for, you know, speed, being out, agile, and uh, the ability to, you know, beat, beat opposing players off the dribble, off my speed and athleticism. And I feel like because I do play in multiple positions, uh, the argument around my game has always been, you know, Crystal's athletic. So that's why she's able to play outside back, play center mid, play, play winger, play uh, center, center forward at times. And, you know, I've really never heard, heard anyone say, it's because she, she understands the game. It's because she is creative. It's because, uh, you know, she has the ability to uh, take on multiple roles and, and understand the game from so many different angles. And, uh, that's really what my point was. It wasn't really to, you know, pat myself on the back, be like, oh, this is the Crystal Dunn show, obviously. But I do think it was an important uh, message that I feel like most Black athletes do get labeled before we even have a chance to uh, put on display and, and show what we really can do. Because the stereotypes of uh, Black athletes being just fast has stuck with us for so long. And I try really hard in my career to really break free from those barriers that I feel, uh, you know, society has placed on Black athletes. Well, Crystal, the interesting thing is that's why I invited all three of you on this, because I think all three of you as players were are or were cerebral players like Steve Zakawani in his case, who is now retired. Jeremy's always been a number nine that has been very smart with his movements, and you've always read the game. And yet, when I read that post, it was impactful because I'm the one holding the microphone. And if I can change anything, uh, I'm open to that. I'm willing to do that. Obviously, I'm going to be more conscious with that. And Jeremy, I want to go now to the article that you wrote because of this, just everything unfolding uh, with George Floyd and that death. You wrote a very, very impactful piece on the medium. Um, just talk about where your emotions are right now over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a challenging week. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're stuck in this cycle where uh, you see a, a black death at the hands of police or, or vigilantes in, in the case of Ahmaud Arbery, uh, enforcing systems that are oppressing black people for all this time. And so for me to have grown up seeing tragedy after tragedy and listening to the discussion that, that comes around from that, uh, growing up in, in a white liberal suburb of Bethesda, Maryland, uh, it started to draw a stark line of divide between some of my friends, some of my classmates, and my teammates and I. Uh, and, and that really impacted me emotionally growing up, uh, knowing that people would find any reason possible to, to discredit the humanity of Trayvon Martin, you know, to try and characterize uh, Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, as, you know, an adult, as if that, was will as if that justified his killing. Uh, and so that really hurt me, and I internalized a lot of that. And talking to my friends, uh, they've, they've come a long way because of this conversation. Uh, but ultimately, I feel that we are, because we're stuck in this cycle, uh, we haven't been able to have the change that we need to have because ultimately people want to make this about George Floyd, uh, want to make it about Breonna Taylor, as opposed to making it about the system that lets black people down on a daily basis from, you know, the criminal justice system to law enforcement to education and housing. Uh, they're all intertwined into forming this, uh, this characterization of a black man or woman. Uh, as a threat, uh, as someone who's not bringing anything good to society. And, and that's kind of where that emotion comes from, uh, not being able to, to get the majority of people uh, to understand that uh, and to keep their attention on that subject. I think, Jeremy, the one thing that has surprised the absolute heck out of me is, is us, through, us four of ha having this conversation right now after a weekend where Bundesliga players and thousands of people in East Germany, Berlin, Germany, are showing up supporting Black Lives Matter. NASCAR addresses it. So I think people are listening. And I wonder, I, I hope this is the tipping point to now policy and action following the conversation 
And Steve, that's where I want to go with you because obviously growing up in London, uh, racism in this sport especially is global. Talk about your experiences as a teenager growing up in London. Yeah, I was, you know, a kid who grew up in North London, which is very, very low income. And I was um, subjected to the basic things. So walking down the street, being stopped by the police, um, age 14, and saying they want to search my bag, search my pockets, and because there'd been a string of break-ins. And I was on my way to football training on that day, going to soccer practice. So, and not understanding why it was happening and then seeing it over and over, over the years. Um, and so you grew up in school in England, not really learning the history, the true history of the British Empire. You kind of, you know, you gloss over the fact that they completely ran to Africa, took all the resources, all the minerals, all the artifacts that are still on display till this day in the British Museum. And nobody speaks about that. You run away from that. So I grew up in a place where you felt as a second class citizen. And the only thing that got me by was I was really good at playing football. And so that got me into rooms and circles and positions that otherwise I never would have been invited in, um, would have been excluded from actually by virtue of the color of my skin. But it doesn't help you all the way because you have millionaire Premier League footballers still subjected to monkey chance, still lip service from the FA, lip service from UEFA. There's no real punishments and people say they're doing something, but when Raheem Sterling is being covered by newspapers in England in a completely racist way and no one says anything, that still goes on to this day and shows me that none of us are immune. Christo, as you watch these protests unfold, um, I'm just curious, as, as a black female athlete, as a black female, uh, emotionally, where have you been at? And do you think this is ultimately going to bring some change? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, not just the black community, but I do think everyone is hurting. Everyone has felt, uh, you know, the impact of George Floyd's death being made viral. Um, and I do believe that everyone I've talked to, I really truly believe that something is different in the air. Um, I think the protests, the the general vibe that I feel from, you know, turning on the TV, seeing those crowds of people from all walks of life um, has really been incredible in this dark time. I feel like that is the light that is shining through. And I truly am moved. I think, unfortunately, it took this death, it took this, the way this man had to die in order for people to really wake up. Um, you know, these two men on the call right now can, can speak on it, but, you know, the Black community wasn't very surprised. This, this happened. Uh, you know, to us, this is just another thing. And I think that is really what is shocking the world is that we believe that this is something so normalized and people for the first time are like, wow, I cannot believe this. So I truly believe that the protesting has been incredible. It's been a breath of fresh air to know that we're all doing it together. Um, I speak so much on that message of knowing that it's not just my community, it's not just me being black feeling like that's enough. It's really about me also educating myself on the voting situation. Um, Cause you know, I, I love when people are posting vote, 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 but we have to dig deeper as to know, as, and to know why voting has been an issue in, in, in black communities or lower income communities. So I just also think I need to be educated so I can also help in the growth, but it's just, it's everyone getting involved and wanting to be the change. Crystal, I couldn't have said it any better. I couldn't agree with you more. Now, Jeremy, that's where I want to go with this because there is a helpless feeling for some of us that care, but we don't really know what to do. What would you tell us? You know, I would say, first of all, listen to your black friends. You know, we're hurting, uh, but we've been through this before. Uh, and that only reinvigorates uh, our purpose to, to righting the wrongs of this country. Uh, and there's just so much material out there. You know, the same books and same documentaries that I'm watching uh, are the ones that other people should be watching. And I've been pushing the 13th on Netflix. You know, I think that was foundational to, to the criminal justice system, how it traced back to slavery through to Jim Crow. Uh, and into mass incarceration, the war on drugs. Uh, and I think that, that that direct line that it draws puts everything into really important context. Uh, and, and that's gotta be the first place for a lot of people to start. Uh, I think Brian Stevenson with the Equal Justice Initiative does an excellent job of, of making you feel empathy for people that you don't know, that you maybe in the past would have rushed to judgment. You know, criminals who, who have done, you know, some, some pretty drastic stuff at times, but there's a story behind each person. And, you know, he says each person is better than the worst thing that they've ever done. And I couldn't agree more, uh, even in all the challenges, uh, the amount of empathy that I've learned out of him has really driven the way I think now. 
Um, but I want to go back to something Crystal said about voting and voting in the black community. Another thing that we can educate ourselves on is, is the idea of voter suppression. Uh, and frankly, the, the idea that, you know, the black vote mobilizing and pushing, you know, Barack Obama in 2008 uh, and ultimately 2012 as well uh, has been seen as a threat in this country into putting people in power that will uh, fix some of the systemic issues that we've been facing. Uh, and with that, we need to we need to right that wrong. Uh, and Fair Fight Action is a group that's doing a really good job of that through Stacey Abrams. Uh, she she lost a, a tight election in Georgia with tons of alleged voter suppression and voter purging from her opponent Brian Kemp. Uh, and and that's all part of the education, knowing that you know it, it's George Floyd dying in the street, but it's also the government that is trying to maintain power and certain people within the government, knowing that you know the wider spread democracy is uh, the less chance they have of having their power uh, and instead of expanding their platform they're just trying to narrow the people who have a say in it. and that's that's frustrating but you know more people need to know about this kind of systemic issue steve is, is the system broken and if it isn't can you explain to our viewers why it's not yeah you know i spent many years thinking broken system let's fix it come together now through deep research, reading, understanding my own history, being born in the Congo, a country that was colonized by Belgium and had a king who genocided 10 million Congolese men, children and women, um, which was completely covered. Growing up in the British Empire, living in the USA for 13 years now. It's not a broken system. It was a system that was designed to work as it is and to serve a very small elite group of society who are still being served by it. And so it's, we can't simply try to repair the system. We have to dismantle it restructure it and rebuild from the ground up because you're looking at what's happening now just you know it's evident self-evident that not all police are bad but the institution of policing is deeply ingrained in racism cover-ups um killing people with no conviction so that's just one area then there's education there is um sorry guys there's education there is banking there's sports there's so many so i think when you speak of a system and just saying, let's repair it, there's a few bad apples, you're dealing with something that was founded on the very idea that some people who are black, not some, all people who are black should be exempt from participating in society. And that's been upheld to this day. You've had some, several amendments that haven't really addressed too much. So you can't talk about a broken system when it's actually a very successful one that is working in the exact way it was intended and for who it was intended to work for. Crystal, Jeremy, Steve, I appreciate you taking the time today. Um, obviously, uh, I'm trying to do my best, give the platform to those that can educate people like myself and people around all of us. And I do know there's a huge part of our community that are very appreciative of your guys' transparency and ability to speak clearly on the subject that allows a lot of us to be more educated. Thanks for joining us today. Taylor, thank you, man. Thank you. Taylor, thanks for having us, and we're always open to it. Well, thank you very much for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming, premium content, and let's not forget as well, ESPN FC, seven days a week. Subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.